Good morning, this is Faith at Faith and Books. I'm really tired this morning. Um, I slept late, it's a kind of rainy, dark morning. And I was gonna do um, Shakespeare Saturday, but I haven't even read the passages yet. Um, and any minute now, the little guy could wake up. So instead, I'm just gonna do a quick review of uh, The Marble Fawn, which I just finished. Uh, the Marble Fawn is, I think it's the last book that Nathaniel Hawthorne published. He might have published other things before his death, um, but I think this might have been the last major book he, he uh, published. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Anyway, uh, I enjoyed it. It's, it's long, though. It's, he's deliberately verbose, it seems to me. Um, but anyway, it's about four friends that are uh, living in Rome. And uh, there are two women and two men. And one of them is named Donatello, and he's the only one who's actually Italian. And he is in love with one of the women named Miriam. Miriam is kind of a mysterious woman. There's rumors about her. No one really knows her background. But she's beautiful, and she's very talented. Um, she, uh, she's, what was interesting was it, this book talks about independent women living, you know, um, away from family um, on their own, trying to make their own living. And she made her living as a portrait artist. Um, and so, she, and she's good friends with another young, beautiful woman named Hilda, who's from New England. And Hilda's specialty is that she has this um, great talent for copying the, the um, the masters. So she does very, very good reproductions. Um, and she has like this sense of how to capture it in a way that's really compelling. Um, and then the fourth person is named Kenyon, and he is also from New England. And he is in love with Hilda. He's like, but he hasn't told her yet. <laughs> um, and um, he is a sculptor. So um, they're living in Rome, and it's just about what happens to them one spring before they're about to leave Rome, or some of them leave Rome, and this terrible thing happens, and um, it's just the repercussions of that, and it's an exploration of art. It really, really goes into the, to aesthetics um, and the history of art. Um, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, I didn't realize this, was a, was a painter. And he had actually wrote the book either during or, or after he had visited Italy for a year and a half. He had become some sort of diplomatic person in England for a while. <clears throat> he got in that position. And then after that was over, he took his wife and I think, you know, who, whatever children were living with him, uh, to Italy for a year and a half. So they really, I mean, he really, it really reflects his deep knowledge of Italy and art. Um, the, it's also a really interesting book because it's about Catholicism versus Protestantism, especially the Pur Puritan version of it, that he, that both Kenyon and Hilda are always reminding themselves they're heirs to the Puritan children of the Puritans. Um, so that was, to me, was really interesting and what he got right and what he got wrong. And what is even more interesting is he he had a daughter, Rose, who actually converted to Catholicism. My cat's trying to get in. Um, who actually converted to Catholicism and became a sister and worked with the poor, I think, in New York. And I think she's up for canonization, too. Like, I think she started the first step of that. So that was kind of interesting. So maybe that whole sojourn um, in, in Rome or in Italy and his, um, and his fascination with exploring Catholicism, he gets stuff wrong. But I, I couldn't tell if he was getting it wrong or if he was just um, showing, because a lot of times Protestants get Catholicism wrong. And so that they'll think that something like, one thing he talks about is the confession, confessional and um, and that, you know, um, Hilda shrinks from the idea of, of confessing to another mortal and getting absolution from another mortal, and that's not 
confession. So, uh, but that's a Protestant misunderstanding. Anyway, so to me, that whole aspect of it was very interesting, him plumbing the depths of Catholicism. Um, um, and it's probably why it isn't, you know, his popular, his most popular um, book either, because I don't think that's a topic that people are particularly interested in, in anymore. Anyway, it was a very, let me let my cat in, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anyway, it was it's a really interesting um, story, and he really plays with the reader because he you can see what he's doing. He sets up this tension. He he gets all gothic and and really descriptive um, about this sort of menace that's going on. He's really talking about good and evil um, and what makes you guilty and what what you know exempts you. And it, this terrible thing that happens, all four of these, this friend group, as my kids would say, um, respond differently to this, this evil thing that has happened. And um, so it, it gets, he's quite, you know, philosophical and theological and literary um, about it all. So, so, but he plays with the reader because he, he likes to do this sort of, build up this sort of gothic suspense, and then he doesn't quite deliver. You don't quite understand what actually happened or why something that he goes into deep description about was significant. Um, and I think at the end, you really realize he's just toying with the reader. And so things go on a little bit too long, like something is about to happen in the action and you're waiting for it to happen. And then just before it happens, he goes into this long digression about some, something about ascetics or something about you know, good and evil and, and contemplating that. So he's having fun with the reader and at the very end, he when he tries to tie up loose ends in this tongue in cheek um, afterward, uh, you can tell that he, he, he just admits, you know, right up front that he was just playing games with the reader. So there's that element of humor I think his writing style is somewhere between Louisa May Alcott and like George Eliot. Just the, he's he's trying to talk about deeper things like George Eliot, but he's got more of a sense of humor, and he's more homey, if that's a good way to describe it, like Louisa May Alcott. Um, so I found it very interesting. Um, it was long, and I got a little bit irritated with Nathaniel for for making things overly wrong long. Um, the I read it in two volumes, so maybe it was originally published that way, but I read it for free on my Kindle. So I read the first volume, uh, which I quite enjoyed. And I mean, I really did. And then I was looking forward to the second volume. Second volume, I felt like it just sort of went on a little too long. He was just, he was just, um, you know, stringing along the reader and building that suspense. And it got a little bit, maybe meant to do that. It got a little bit old uh, as the book was going along. Um, but it was, I, I found it really interesting and thought-provoking, and I'm really glad I read it. And was there anything else that I wanted to say about it? I enjoyed it. Um, so now I think I have read all his major works, which was a goal I had for myself. Um, and I think I'll, I might reread certain ones, like um, um, The House of Seven Gables. I keep thinking I want to reread that one. But anyway, so that is my brief uh, summary and review of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Marble Fawn. So tomorrow it'll be Shakespeare Sunday, and I'll get my act together, and um, I'll get in, back into Shakespeare. All right, take care. Bye-bye.